Hello, and welcome to the Nintendo Power Retrospectives. I'm Count Zero. That's right, we're back! I have finished my degree, and thus the time has come for me to return to making my way through the myriad issues of Nintendo Power. But what you mean the time has come, I mean the available time has come to me to allow me to make my way through myriad issues of Nintendo Power. When we last left the magazine, we had finished the third year of Nintendo Power, so it's time to take a look at the best of the rest of Nintendo Power now, we've got 14 games to cover here, so I'm going to split this into two parts, with seven episodes each. This episode in particular is going to have five RPGs to get through, so there's a lot of ground to cover. Let's get started. Tombs and Treasure was developed by Nihon Falcom for the PC-88 in Japan and ported to the NES by Infocom. If that name sounds familiar to you, that's the same Infocom that developed Zork and uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy and Leather Goddesses of Phobos, and numerous other text adventure games for the Atari 800 and DOS and various other PC systems. Um, this game is a visual novel in the same vein as Princess Tomato of the Salad Kingdom in terms of game style, but it's more serious. Princess Tomato is a much more lighthearted game, whereas this one, it's more Indiana Jonesy. This game also has a little more combat than Princess Tomato did, although the combat works almost the same way. Instead, your ability in combat is based on your character's level, with the character automatically leveling up based on what puzzles you've completed, and consequently your process through the story. This serves as a subtle way of telling you that you've missed something important. If the fights become a close-run thing, or just playing too hard, you need to double back and check to see what you've missed, or at the very least, it lets you know that you're in the wrong place and you need to keep exploring. If you're able to beat each fight without any risk of dying, then you're in the right place, you're on the right track, and you keep moving along that route. The rest of the game is your usual adventure game tactics of taking notes, looking at everything, and combining items to see what happens. This is a decent enough game, and probably one worth picking up if you're someone who enjoys visual novels. Now, the Final Fantasy Legend for the Game Boy originally released as the first title in the Saga series in Japan, as a game, is grindy as hell and also kind of obtuse. Weapons degrade based on use, like in the Fire Emblem series, so weapons gained in dungeons aren't as valuable. Additionally, characters, unlike most other RPGs, don't level up based on defeating enemies, but instead advance differently based on what character race they are. Humans gain ability points and hit points by using items which they purchase in stores or find in dungeons which costs money. Mutants, or espers in the Japanese version, randomly gain experience and ability points based on actions performed in combat, whether it's attacking with certain kinds of weapons, using mutant powers, and so on. And they also randomly gain and lose psychic abilities. And there are monsters who can't encrypt gear, but gain and lose power based on what meat from what monsters they eat. It's a game that requires a lot of patience and a lot of experimentation. Fortunately, the game lets you save anywhere and everywhere, which lets you save scum to avoid catastrophe, but it doesn't let you do multiple save slots, so you can stagger yourself, so if you discover you have gone down the, the wrong track a while back, you can't backpedal or what have you until you reach a place where you haven't screwed yourself. This would kind of make for a decent road trip or podcast game, but it's still something of an unpleasant chore to play. Next, we have Paperboy 2 for the Game Boy. Now, Paperboy 1 and 2 on consoles weren't good games to begin with. There, I said it. The orientation of the screen simply doesn't work right for your standard 4x3 CRT monitor. Never mind a 16x9 LCD monitor these days. This is a game that, to work better, would need to be in something like a sideways perspective, a 3x4 or a 9x16 perspective. Something that gives you plenty of room to plan ahead and react to stuff in front of you so you can move the appropriate amount of degrees on screen. So when we come to Paperboy 2 on the on a Game Boy, a smaller screen with lower resolution, things pretty much go in the crapper. I mean, the game controls well enough for a Paperboy game, but that's the caveat. For a Paperboy game. Honestly, this is a game which I really feel work would work in an arcade setup with, again, a 9x16 or 3x4 screen. 
something where it's taller than it is wide, you can get an idea of how of where you need to be on the screen based on what obstacles are coming up ahead. Next we have Wizardry, Book 1, Proving Grounds of the Mad Overlord. It's kind of interesting that we have the first Wizardry game in this episode, along with Final Fantasy Legend. Now, both these games are very grind-heavy games, but Wizardry shows how to do grinding right. In, wi in Wizardry, in most RPGs in general, there are three different axes of, of advancement and progression in the game, and ideally, these are all in some way straightforward, or if they are commingled, they're commingled in a fashion where um, the relationship makes sense. First, we have power progression. You kill monsters or complete quest objectives and gain experience points. These level up your characters and makes them more powerful, either through giving additional hit points and ability points or by gaining new spells. When you go to the inn and rest, in wizardry, additionally, you get more information on how many experience points you need to level up. So there's the clear idea of, here's how powerful I am, here's how much more I need to go to become more powerful, and everything maps out nicely. Then there's monetary progression. You kill monsters, you get money, and you can use that money to upgrade your weapons and armor, and to buy support items to help you last longer in the dungeon. This also lets you resurrect fallen characters and recover from status effects of the temple, and lets you stay at nicer rooms at the inn, which lets you recover more hit points and magic at the same time. All of these things getting you back in the dungeon faster with less of a layover time, because this game is well your character's age. And so with the monetary clear progression here of more money equals more power or less of a turnaround, allowing you to get further in the dungeon more quickly. Then we have physical progression, or in other RPGs, like the Final Fantasy games, you have this is narrative progression. Wizardry, in order to succeed, encourages, if not requires you, to draw a map. This means that as you make your way through the game, you are drawing a map of your progress. Consequently, you have a record of how far you've explored in this level of the dungeon, and a marker of literally how far you've gone in the game. In Wizardry, all of these forms of progression have clear and specific indicators of your progress. You know how far you've come because of your indicators in terms of how much money you have, how much experience you've accumulated, and how to the dungeon you've mapped. In Final Fantasy Legend, on the other hand, your weapons wear down, so your monetary progression is restricted because you have to keep buying additional weapons and additional weapons. Your power progression is based on item usage or random chance, so that's limited based by either how much money you can afford to spend on leveling up items, or by the sheer fickle whims of fate. So, uh, on top of that, this means that your grinding for experience is often accomplished by, grind by wandering around right outside of town, so you can hurry back to recover your hit points and that sort of thing. So that's limited too. Heck, even with the Soul series, which combines a monetary and power progression by using both by using souls as both money and experience points, the indicators are still clear. You need so many souls to increase an attribute to repair a weapon or to get equipment from a dealer. Additionally, the bonfire system provides a sense of physical progression. You know you've advanced because you've reached the next bonfire. So, it's clear, it's clear here how wizardry makes this work, and Final Fantasy Legend doesn't. This leads again to Dragon Quest II. Dragon Quest II is another interesting step up for the series. The first game was a largely unguided affair where you have two objectives. Rescue the princess, then defeat the dragon lord. And given general information where the um, first one is, and specific information where the where the second one is, you can see it right across the, um, the, the sea from you, but no information on how to get there, and you're set loose. The game was grindy, but it still worked along those progression guidelines of how far can you get from the last town, before you have to double back and heal up. Dragon Warrior 2, on the other hand, is a much more narrative structure. The game even opens with a narrative cutscene, like we see later in the Final Fantasy games, with a new enemy in the form of the wizard Hargon. In this game, unlike the first title, you're not going alone. You have to assemble a party of adventurers to defeat Hargon. But what's noticeable here is that your objective is to assemble them. You're not creating these characters from the beginning of the game, like in Wizardry, like in Final Fantasy 1. They're all characters in the world you have to find. 
put this into perspective of the three axes, this puts narrative progression in combination with power progression. The further you get through the quest, through the quest, at least in the early portions of the game, the more characters you get, which means the more force and power you can project onto the field of battle, with each character having different strengths and weaknesses, which will change how you attack some opponents. Your starting character is much more of a conventional fighter. Your um, ne second character, you get the prince, is more like the hero from the original Dragon Quest, where they can do melee attacks and cast spells, and the third character, the princess, can cast magic. Example. Next up is our uh, final RPG of the episode, Destiny of an Emperor. Now, Destiny of an Emperor, like Dragon Quest, is yet another grindy RPG. This tends to come up a lot in the NES era. This time it's based on the Romance of the Three Kingdoms. Like Dragon Quest II, it handles the grinding fairly well by switching, by structuring progression along the three axes, both interesting spin on the formula. One of the tough bits in console RPGs is managing your offense and defense, and in particular, protecting your spellcasters. Oftentimes, you have situations where an enemy will attack with a spell that hits all party members, and in the process, takes out your squishy caster. Your casters are always squishy. What Destiny Emperor does is you cannot cast spells, or use tactics, as it's called in the game, without selecting a tactician. Whoever your tactician is will not be able to take part in combat, but instead determines what tactics are available, and how many tactic points, or TP, you have at your disposal. On your turn, one party member will then have the option to use a tactic in place of using a normal attack or defending. This is a fun and interesting way to structure your party dynamic. You no longer have the stress of I going, I have to protect my squishy caster, while also providing an interesting strategic dynamic. If you have a general who is strong in combat and also has some very valuable tactics available, do you prevent yourself from using those tactics by putting him in combat and using his using those combat abilities, or do you make him the tactician and reduce the number of combat powerhouses you are able to field in battle? It's a really nice touch. Finally this episode, we have Knight Rider. Knight Rider is not a fun game. This game is kind of like an odd mix of Rad Racer and Spy Hunter, which is the problem with the game. Rad Racer works because you're just focusing on racing and dodging cars, sort of like with, among other titles, Pole Position. Spy Hunter works because there aren't bosses and levels, it's a very unstructured game. You just survive for as long as you can, get as many points as you can by continuing to drive and shooting enemies. And that and that's also combined with a top-down perspective with a 9x16 style camera angle, or game perspective, or what have you, which lets you better plan for what's coming again coming ahead. See also my complaints about well, Paperboy. However, Knight Rider uses the gameplay, the, the drive-and-shoot gameplay of Spy Hunter with the camera perspective of Rad Racer, which doesn't give you enough time to plan for the enemies ahead and avoid them, while also requiring you to dodge back and forth and shoot lots of enemies and all that other stuff. It's not fun. It's a real slog. And it leads to lots of unpleasant, cheap deaths. All of the games reviewed this issue are single-player games, and frankly, I don't consider the Game Boy games worth commending. Not even Final Fantasy Legend. So, I'm only going to recommend one game. That said, this is still a tough choice. I really like console RPGs, and we've got a lot of good ones here. I would go with Dragon Warrior 2, as it's certainly superior to the first title. But it's also a game that's really expensive to get for the NES. The Game Boy Color release of the game is more affordable, but it's also not very good. So I'll take that. I'm going to kind of backpedal here and do, do, do two games. One is the import and run with the translation patch on your Retron 5 recommendation, and the other one is the actual hunt down a copy of this recommendation. If you have a Retron 5, I'd recommend picking up the Super Famicom collection of Dragon Quest 1 and 2 and running that with a translation patch. Um, there's a very there's some very good ones out there, and it'll let you get a much better gameplay experience at a lower cost than, would get, than it would run you to just pick up the NES version of the game. So that's definitely a better, op better option there than just hunting down an NES version. On a pick of the domestic release version, 
Um, I'd recommend going with Wizardry, Proving Grounds of the Mad Overlord. I enjoyed Destiny Emperor as well. It's sort of a close runner-up, but Wizardry is more affordable, and I, I'm a fan of dungeon crawlers. I own every Etrian Odyssey game. Um, I've picked up more than a few dungeon crawlers for my for various other handheld systems. Wizardry for the NES is definitely a game that's worth picking up. Um, that said, on your way back from the store or wherever you picked up the game, assuming you didn't buy it on eBay, I'd recommend swinging by an Office Depot or someplace else and picking up some quarter-inch grass paper and some pencils. You're going to need those, too. So, next time, we're going to hit the back seven and finish up our best of the rest for Nintendo Power's third year. See you next time.